All right. Chapter two talks about medical equipment, and we also talk about the nursing process of examination. Uh, it's a four-step process. We need to know them in order. So when I tell you to take an extra couple of seconds and write some things down, how about take a couple extra seconds and write some things down because you're going to need it for sure. Um, I don't want you memorizing. Uh, I know you've heard this before. So professors, teachers, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call us, we um, will always tell you don't memorize, but we never explain why we don't want you to memorize and what exactly memorization means. Memorization means I'm literally reading the question that in that particular case, and I'm memorizing the answer. You're not understanding conceptual framework when you do that. You're just memorizing the answer. And trust me when I say no two questions in this world are going to be alike. So that's why memorization is a waste of time. And uh, understanding the conceptual framework behind why something is the way it is is kind of how I like to do things. Um, because if you know the why, then you've got 90% of your answer. So... Uh, get your notes ready, and I'm going to try to make this as fast as possible. I cracked it from like 69 slides to like 47 slides, so that's better. Um, and then the other section should be fast, and then I will do our comprehensive overview and have that posted by uh, hopefully the end of tonight. All right, so I, I feel like this has been buried into the ground and then uh, re-brought back as if, you know, somebody was touching Lazarus and bringing them from the dead. But here we go. Hand hygiene, most important component to reducing infection and transmission. Um, hand hygiene needs to be done uh, when you walk into the room. You should be sterilizing your hands. And then when you leave the room as well. If you're going to be touching your patient and they have anything oozing, um, you better be washing your hands really well. And I, if I were you, I'd rush, wash them up to the elbows because that's just my practice, especially being um, a pre- and post-COVID nurse uh, working ICUs, um, and especially during COVID, that was that was that was a time. Um, you know, we used to tuck our pant legs into our boots, which is why I still blouse my my pants as if I'm in the military because whatever we need to do to not die was a great day, uh, and hey, it worked. <laughs> so. At least for me, it did. Um, make sure that you understand if someone has a latex allergy that we have to be mindful for that because they can go into anaphylaxis for that. It's never the first exposure. It's always the second exposure. That's how uh, the mediated system works when it comes to anaphylaxis and allergies. So we have to make sure that we, uh, we don't place any latex around them. Most gloves in a hospital system now are non-latex. They're horrible. They get stuck to your hands, but you got to do what you got to do for, for the better of everybody. Um, so on this slide, most important, hand hygiene. And also be mindful of latex allergies. And uh, we need to find a derivative for that latex allergy to make sure that we don't put them in, in into anaphylaxis. So the first process of an examination is inspection. So we need to look at them. Are they breathing heavily? Are they turning blue? Um, all of this information is going to be considered subjective data if coming from the patient, objective data if we can narrow it down. So if I say a patient cyanotic, that's objective data. The patient has cyanosis. They're blue. I can easily see that. They look like an avatar. Okay, it is what it is versus them saying, I don't feel like I can breathe well, but I got their O2 sat on and it says that they're 96, but they're going into a panic attack. That would be subjective data. Please understand the difference because this test is heavily, 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 heavily on objective versus subjective data because it's that important in, in nursing. And since we're starting at the very top or at the very the beginning of that foundation, like we're not even in foundation yet, we need to make note of that. So first exam, more than half of it, objective versus subjective. Just be ready for it. It's going to be a thing. So I'm going to talk this whole time about examples of both. So please take note of those things. Make yourselves a sheet of paper. Fold it in half long ways. Do objective, subjective. When you hear me on these recordings say, here's an example of objective data, a.k.a., I have a temperature of 97.9. That is objective data, right? Temperature 97.9 under the objective data column. And what you're going to do is you're going to see a trend and a pattern of how objective data looks versus how subjective data looks. And then that's going to be easier for you to, you know, break 
in between which is which. And then you'll get full credit for those points and do fantastic on my exam, just like everybody always does. So when we're talking about inspection, um, you need to make sure you have a critical eye, obviously. Um, you need to make sure that you avoid any distractions that would potentiate damaging any of your data. So if you have a patient that's relaxed but a baby's running around, you're going to note that they're going to look anxious. Looking anxious is considered subjective data because we don't know what's really going on in their brain. So if they look a certain way, if they act a certain way, if they think a certain way, if we think they think a certain way, all subjective, okay? If she's 86 years old, objective, right? I can objectively find that numerical data within records, okay? If you hear any popping and sizzling, uh, we're, we're making breakfast while we're doing this, so <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, Make sure that you use equipment to facilitate your inspection appropriately. So like a pen like an otoscope, an ophthalmoscope, you know, a, a speculum of some sort, whatever that looks like. Okay, so now we're going to talk about palpation. So it goes inspection, palpations number two, percussions number three, auscultations number four. <clears throat> we always start low and slow. So um, people will say, well, it doesn't make any sense because palpation is physically touching the patient percussion is kind of touching the patient and auscultation is not even touching the patient at all but here's how you need to look at it so inspection means i'm looking at them palpation means i'm touching the surface area of their body when i am percussing a person i'm actually going into the depths of their body into the body cavity if you think about it because i'm listening for timpani or i'm listening for dullness over the body system because i'm basically doing what's called echolocation a reverberation through that body cavity when I'm doing percussion and then auscultation means I'm listening to the central part of their body so I don't want you to look at it as in the physical way that you would do least invasive to most invasive I mean from an internal perspective I'm literally listening to the insides of your heart and the confines of your ventricles and your atria that is far deeper than me touching the surface of your body and you know looking and feeling for a respiration so that's what that is so palpation is um, putting your hands over an area of personal space right um, we're looking for things like texture size consistency masses fluid crepitus crepitus is the worst sound in the world crepitus sounds like you're walking over rice crispy treats and breaking them open um, it's usually for people uh, who are elderly and have the clicky bone syndrome is what i call it uh, it physically makes me sick, or it did when I first started off in nursing. Everyone's going to have something that's going to physically make them ill when you first start off. It's okay. Just keep going through it. Remember the person that you're helping, and if you remember the person that you're helping, whatever disease process they have, even if they got you know an eye popping out <laughs> and they're holding it, it's not going to bother you because it's the person that you want to get better so it becomes bigger than the disease itself. I hope that makes sense to you. So <clears throat> when we're touching people, we need to make sure, A, hand washing. We want to make sure we're not going to give injury to the patient. We're going to make sure that we um, have considered their cultural uh, preferences because some people don't like to be touched. Some people need permission in a couple of minutes um, to be prepared for someone to touch them. We have a lot of abuse victims as well that we have to consider. We need to let them know what we're doing, why we're doing it, how this is going to help them. And it only takes about 10 seconds to do all those things. So you walk in the door and you go, hi, I'm Molly. I'm your nurse for today. How are you doing? Really quick, I'm just going to do a head-to-toe assessment on you. Is it okay if I go ahead and um, pull this down or pull your blankets down so that I can touch your feet? Okay, I'm going to touch your feet now. All right, I'm just checking pulses. You're fine. So how's your day going today? Keep their mind off of it. Try to include them in that process of palpation if you have to like if someone says that they have uh, a random pain um, you're going to want to palpate around and see if there's any abscesses see if there's any growths see if there's anything uh, that feels like it might be a break feel fill around for um, a potential for a contusion right um, we would just quickly go all right I'm going to lightly palpate this lightly palpating is one centimeter 
deep palpation is going to be about four centimeters. And the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture of what the two look like, uh, light versus deep, so you have a better idea. Um, if someone is going to have something oozing, put on gloves. Don't make the mistake of not putting on gloves. You'll only do it once, I promise you. Um, I, I've definitely done it once and have never done it again. So just make sure that you're being mindful of those things. Um, especially if we're messing with items that are dry and flaky, you need to really watch out for those because, um, those, if you take off socks with dry and flaky feet with no gloves, um, you might have, you know, a handful of scales. Uh, I don't know how else to say that. It's just being honest. So um, make sure that you're always wearing your gloves and make sure if you're taking off socks with flaky feet that you hold your breath. And I'm going to let you figure out why you need to hold your breath on your own. So let's go to the next slide. So light palpation versus deep palpation. Light palpation is one centimeter. So to the first, uh, the first joint that you have at your finger. Um, and then of course your knuckle is going to be considered four centimeters. Um, so just know light palpation versus deep palpation. Obviously we're not going to deep palpate anything if they're having massive abdominal pain because we could perforate something. Maybe there's an intestinal blockage, uh, but we could, uh, you know, by deep palpating, we can actually perforate that intestine depending on how big it already is. So we have to be really, really careful not to do that if someone's having massive amounts of pain. Um, however, when we do deep palpation, well, this is pretty simple. If we have someone who has congestive heart failure and they have, you know, swollen legs, we're going to want to see how swollen they are. How bad is that edema? So this is where we would use light versus deep palpation. All right. So continuing on with palpation by manual technique is using both hands. Um, and then light palpation should always be first followed by Deep palpation, we have to be really careful with those things so that we don't end up hurting somebody like we just talked about in the slide before. All right, so percussion is the, we call it the, the ancient nursing. Uh, we've been percussing people for thousands of years to see if there is um, an enlargement of an organ, if there is a border of an organ. Um, we actually did this in class. We had two lovely people who were willing to lay down on a flat table <laughs> and have me percuss so we can kind of hear what that sounds like. Um, when you are in a closed room and everyone's quiet and there aren't 30 people breathing at one time or giggling or whatever, it's a lot easier to hear it, believe it or not, uh, especially when you're in a very, very tiny room because everything kind of echoes around you so you can hear it a lot better. Um, but it's meant to detect tenderness. It's meant to figure out if there's fluid in the body cavity, right? Um, if you hit a hard organ like the liver, it's going to be very, very dull and tight versus if you were going over and percussing the intestinal area of the abdomen, it's going to be kind of light and airy, right? So it's a difference between timpani and dullness. And then we're about to get into um, percussion and what the definitions actually mean. And we need to be familiar with the vocabulary that goes around the idea of percussion. So this slide <clears throat> basically tells you how to percuss. However, I'm not a fan of reading stereo instructions to figure out how to do something. So I would encourage you to YouTube it. Everyone's technique is a little bit different. Some techniques work really well. Some techniques don't work so well at all. See what works best for you. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, the ideal way of percussing. I don't percuss it that way because my way, I feel, sounds a little bit better for me. But you're going to figure out what works best for you. So I would encourage you, rather than me reading this slide, you can read it yourself, to just YouTube what percussion over a lung field looks like or percussion over um, an abdominal field looks like. And that way you'll have a better idea of the technique that's used. And then maybe you can, you know, practice it on, you know, I don't know, one of the kids or whoever you have around the house. Um, I used my kids a lot, especially when I was in my anatomy and physiology class, because I would physically grab um, like a, a non-toxic uh, uh, dry erase marker that just washes off very quickly. And I would literally write um, whatever muscle group I was learning that week on my kids. <laughs> and that's how I learned it or the bones or whatever. And they would walk around thinking that they were funny and cool because they got to walk around looking like they had a bunch of 
tattoos when they were seven, eight, nine years old. And as they were walking around, I was memorizing them for that day. I know it sounds weird, but I, I've never forgotten, you know, what that looks like to this day. Um, so yeah, if you ever have an opportunity to do that, use, use them, right? That's what they're for. <laughs> they're there to help you. So kids love helping out their parents and they thought it was cool to have, you know, their arm written on for the whole day or, um, to have, uh, things written on their feet so that I could learn, you know, all the bones are on their hands so that I know, you know, capitate and hamate bones kind of a deal. Um, so utilize them and see if, if they're willing to let you feel what percussion feels like and hear what percussion sounds like. Um, and I'm sure that they would be a hundred percent cool to do that because they, they love to help us out. Right. That's what kids are great for. All right, and then here we are again. This is examination using percussion. They're going over the lung fields. They're listening for fluid in the lungs, more than likely. Um, and it sounds uh, pretty prominent when you do tap into it and you, you can hear it uh, pretty obvious. Um, they might also be in the area that they're in, although I don't believe that that is what they're trying to strike for, is they could be striking to see if uh, there's any enlargement of the gallbladder or any indicator of gallstones. Um, this is more than likely a lung field test, uh, but either way, uh, this is just what percussion looks like from this person's perspective. And again, I usually tap a little bit lower cause I hear the sound better that way for me. Um, but just find out what works best for you and give it a go. And like I said, find, find a crash test dummy to, you know, sit down while you're trying to figure out how it works and it might not work the first time or the second time or even the 10th time. But when you finally have it you got it and it's stuck and you're always going to do it that way and it's always going to work for you and athena agrees my kid she just she just sounded off like a soldier so there you go all right so here's our percussion vocabulary we have timpani it's loud it's high pitched sound heard over the abdomen so like i said timpani sounds like light and airy and high pitched high pitched things are usually uh in case with a lot of space Resonance um, is heard over the lung tissue. Hyperresonance is heard over, over in overinflated lungs, like in emphysema. Dullness is heard over the liver, and then flatness is heard over bones and muscle. Flat is like hard as a rock, right? Dullness means it has a very low and tight sound, and flatness is just like this. Right. It's just like hearing a hard surface. All right. So if you want to articulate the sound and understand what that means, again, YouTube it. Just YouTube timpani um, heard over the abdomen. And they're going to have like a microphone right on top of someone percussing so that you can hear what it sounds like. That would be my best suggestion. All right. So auscultating. Auscultating, you need to make sure that you're in a quiet place. You need to make sure that your patient isn't talking while you're trying to listen to their heart and their lung sounds or their abdominal sounds. If you are listening to heart and lungs and they start, you know, jacking their jaws about whatever's been going on or when is my lab or when is my MRI supposed to be done, um, you're not going to be able to hear a thing. So you need to let them know that they just need to sit still while you listen really quickly and uh, then we'll get right back to, you know, doing whatever we were doing. As long as they understand that, you should be okay. Note that if they have a bunch of hair on their chest and you start, uh, you know, hopping lung fields, you're going to hear um, what sounds like someone scraping over a comb with sound because, I mean, it's amplified, right? There are two sides to your stethoscope. Uh, there is a uh, diaphragm and there's a bell, um, or what they call a drum or a bell. The bell's the one that's got the hole in it. So if you have it turned the wrong way and you have it turned to the bell, um, that is for, you know, tapping into carotids or listening to little kiddos. Um, it's also used for a couple of other things that we'll talk about later. But if you have it flipped the wrong way and then you go to listen to regular heart and lung sounds, it's not going to be a thing. It's not going to happen. So very casually turn it around to the other direction if you don't hear what you're supposed to hear and move on. If they know that you have improperly flipped it, um, they're going to ask you, you know, how long have you been a nurse? And that means in, uh, in patient translation, are you competent enough to be in my room right now? If you ever hear how long have you been a nurse, that means they want you to read the resume that is you 
And you go, oh, I've been a nurse for a pretty good amount of time. Uh, and I've done this and this and this. And this is the part where you would let them know, you know, what kind of patients you deal with. And usually if I have someone that gets a little snippy with me, I mean, at this point, and my resume is pretty, pretty full. Uh, but when I would get people who, uh, you know, thought that they were just the bee's knees, better than everybody. And they would go, you know, well, how long have you been a nurse? And I'm like, what type? And they go, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you know, you're here for a lung problem. I'm, I'm used to dealing with people you know, that we have to give propofol to because, you know, in the ICU, that's kind of how that works. And as soon as you say that, they shut up. Um, so that might be helpful to you is to let them know not how long you've been a nurse specifically, but what types of patients you've encountered. Um, if you don't have a lot of time in grade, because that usually quiets them down just as much as you telling them how long you've been a nurse. Uh, you don't want to just say something like a year or, you know, three years um, or 10 years even. You need to let them know the level of competency and the way you're going to do that is to like I said, give them the, the most uh, appropriate patient that you've dealt with um, and say, yeah, I've been a nurse for a pretty fair amount of time. I usually get a patient uh, with your background often enough, uh, but usually I, I get uh, kind of heavier patients. So today's a light day. Today's a good day for me. And that indicates to them that, man, you ain't nothing. I ain't worried about you. And then that calms them down because remember, there are people in this world that think that they are, you know, the upper chain of, of how life works. And here's the deal. There is no chain. There is no better or worse, right? There's no such thing as somebody being better or worse than somebody else. It's all your contextual reference and your understanding of what it means to you. But truly, if it's right for them, who's to say it's right or wrong, period. So, those guys, you just gotta, you just gotta kind of bite the bullet. You gotta kind of be cool. Um, and again, don't tell them a number, all right? Because they're gonna be expecting a number. Tell them in a, your own way of telling them that their disease process is not affecting you, and that you are a subject matter expert at their disease process, and they should back off of you. Um, so that's auscultation and a little bit of let me help you out with your first year as a nurse because that question is going to come around a lot. I like to give you opportunities as a nursing student to learn what not to do. And I am a subject matter expert um, in nursing, but more importantly, a subject matter expert of what not to do to mess up because I'm probably better at that than I am at my craft itself, because if it's been done before, it's probably been done by me, uh, which is why, I, you know, I'm kind of cool now, and which is why I'm a phenomenal nurse and a phenomenal practitioner today. So there, learn from my mistakes, and let's go to the next slide. So I feel like patient positioning doesn't need a whole heck of a lot of time. Uh, patient positioning is just the position of comfort, basically. It's usually sitting or they're supine. Um, there needs to be appropriate draping. You don't want to start inspecting something or palpating something if they're frozen solid and then you throw all the sheets off of them, right? Like you always want to have a hot bath blanket on them or, or whatever they call it nowadays to keep them cozy and warm and happy because it's going to throw off our assessment if we've got them frozen solid and they're shaking and they're cyanotic and then we document these things as such and then they go what the heck's wrong with the patient and it's not the patient that's the problem it was you and your inability to prepare your patient for inspection or for you know the examination itself if that makes any sense so, so we want to give them the best opportunity to give us the best collective data uh, during their examination for, you know, that time frame of four hours or whatever it is that you'll be doing that in. Most people will do um, your assessment every four hours unless you m manage to get onto an ICU, which happens nowadays, especially post-COVID. Um, back in my day, if that was the thing, uh, we had to have a solid year and a half of experience on a med surge or a progressive care unit before we could even look in the direction of an ICU. I was actually an exception because I worked as an SC STNA in the PCU, so that's a progressive care unit. So they threw me onto the neuro ICU within my first year. 
Um, and that was kind of cool and also incredibly scary, but it made me kind of great. So if you have an opportunity to go to an ICU, I know it sounds scary as all get out. I want you to go for it. And here's why, because nothing, I swear, nothing, one more time, Nikola Tesla does things in threes, nothing in this universe is going to fear, is going to create as, as much fear as the first year in an ICU. And after that, it's all downhill. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you don't have to worry about, you know, biting yourself. Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Am I this, that? No, jump into it head first, jagged rocks and all like glass at the bottom, maybe, right? At least it's pretty. So do it because if you do that, then going to a med surge unit is a joke. And when you hear med surge nurses talking about, oh, they're terrible day, they've got five patients and they gotta go get another glass of water to somebody. And you're like, dude, I do one-to-one -one total care. What are you talking about? It, it is a cakewalk and you'll enjoy it. And then people will enjoy you and they'll ask you to come back and you'll have more opportunities for income. Trust me. I, I know how this works. I know how to maximize your income as a nurse. Listen to the words that come out of my mouth. If you ever want to have this discussion on how to make your first 100K within five years of being a nurse, come see me. I can show you. I can do it in less than five because it absolutely can be done. And all you have to do is just be your best self, live your best life, and show everybody how well you shine. But you got to take risks. And the first risk is if you have an opportunity to get into an ICU, do it. Okay? So that's my spiel on patient positioning and a little bit more. Let's go to the next slide. So yes, I have a slide dedicated to thermometers, believe it or not. we got electronic thermometers, tympanic. We've got temporal artery thermometers. Um, there's rectal thermometers. Please understand that there are two different types of electronic thermometers. One of them is a rectal thermometer. Do not put that in somebody's mouth. Not being funny, haha, -ha, because they all have covers. But a rectal thermometer is going to is going to uh, gauge differently because it is looking for internal temperature versus external temperature versus uh, a temperature that is a, a segue in between the two or a gradient that goes up under your tongue, right? So you have to watch out for this because a rectal thermometer literally has a red top on it, right? As in made a danger, it's going into the danger zone. Please don't use that one with a, pr a finger or a finger probe with a probe cover and stick it in somebody's mouth because if they happen to be a nurse, they're going to be really angry with you. Um, but you're not going to get the right measurement, right? So we need to use the right tool for the right measurement, basically. So just take note of these. I'm not going to test you on which one's electronic versus tympanic. Um, I don't think I, no, I don't think I am, but just know the different variants and types because nurses will ask for the electronic thermometer or the tympanic thermometer, and you're going to need to know which one those are. So uh, look at it, kind of take it to heart and then move on. Let's go to the next slide. All right. A stethoscope. A stethoscope is a nurse's best friend for many reasons, right? Ear pieces, you can get hard ones, you can get soft ones. I'm going to encourage you right now, don't ever mess with a hard piece because if your ears are sensitive, it's not your jam. I have very sensitive ears. I can tell if something's been in my ear for too long. They'll start hurting, they'll start aching. That's just me personally. I've noticed a lot of you guys um, have trouble putting those in there because the ones that we issue you have the harder ear pieces. If, if you go and open up your box, there should be softer ear pieces in there. Switch them. Just take them off. Put the other ones on. Um, they, I'm going to tell you about the anatomy of a stethoscope so you can see what you can pull apart, what you can put together, what you can do to fix it. If you break your stethoscope, like the plastic covering, there usually is a secondary plastic piece in there for your diaphragm so that you can still change it out if, it, if you crack it. If you don't have an extra piece, I can still show you how to do it. You can actually do it with paper, believe it or not. This stethoscope is something we've been using for eons and eons. Uh, I believe it's as old as 3,000 years we found um, artifacts that relate to what could have been a stethoscope. Um, and they, they have used it with a, a simple piece of um, lanolin. Um, or a simple piece of uh, something that is as thick as a papyrus, but not obviously a papyrus because those um, degradate pretty easy. So bottom line is there's a million different types of stethoscopes. One day you guys might be cool and buy the super gnarly $500 stethoscope. If you have hearing problems, ask your unit if they provide 
a waiver or um, a voucher to get a stethoscope that has an electronic proponent on it. So my stethoscope, because I'm super cool, it is a digital stethoscope. So I, I turn it on, it's battery operated, right? So I turn her on and I can hear things and I can um, elevate the amplitude or I can elevate the frequency or I can elevate the vibration on it. Um, I can also then Bluetooth those sounds, those lung sounds, those heart sounds to my doc um, as a nurse. Uh, now that I am a doc, which is kind of weird, um, I, I can save it onto a file and keep it for patient reference. Like you can do a lot of cool things with these things. The ones you guys have right now, these are basic starters and there's nothing wrong with that. You gotta, you gotta know what it sounds like from a weak, uh, stethoscope perspective to be able to appreciate it from a high resonance perspective. Um, so the next slide is going to be the anatomy of stethoscope and I'm going to quickly explain what you can and can't do with these things and how you can troubleshoot some problems that you might have. Um, and then I will tell you some, do not do this under any circumstance because there are some people that do things to flash around the fact that they're a nurse and that's super cute, but you're going to ruin your stethoscope doing it. So let's talk about that in the next slide. All right. So I'm going to use what I believe is my pen light tool. Do I have that here? Yeah, look at that. That's gnarly. All right, cool. Sorry. I'm still learning how to do the new slide share on PowerPoint. Uh, it's not because I'm old, guys. It's because I just haven't used this platform before. So here is the anatomy of a stethoscope. You've got your bell. You've got your diaphragm. Your bell is the one with the hole. This is your bell. So this is the one we're going to listen for fine-tuned processing. Sorry, there's a Big Mac truck coming by. All right, now that that's done. So uh, this is the bell. We're going to listen to carotids with this. We're going to listen to... Uh, murmurs with this, all of the fine-tuned pieces. Um, the other side, which is the bigger side, is your diaphragm. It has a plastic piece on the diaphragm and that's what helps with the vibration uh, that allows you to hear through this tubing. Um, if you ever crack it and break it, there should be a secondary one in that box that comes with your stethoscope. If you don't have that box with you and you don't have that and you're like, oh my god, my stethoscope's ruined for the day. No, it's not. Here's what you do. What you do is you grab a piece of paper. I know you're going to think I'm crazy. Grab any piece of construction paper, any piece of regular paper. Heck, you can do it with notebook paper. I've done it with notebook paper. And I want you to cut a hole that fits around. This piece right here just screws off. So screw the piece off. Take the plastic out. Put a piece of paper in there. And make sure that it fits around the edges perfectly. And then screw it back on. And you now have a brand new stethoscope that works almost better than that plastic piece because there isn't a whole heck of a lot between the two of you. Now, are we gonna do this in a pinch? Yes, are we gonna do this for every patient? Well, here's the problem. When you go to assess every patient, you have to re-clean that plastic piece, which is why it's plastic. Can you do that with a solid piece of paper? No, you cannot. So the problem with this is, is if you happen to break it every four hours when you go to listen to somebody, you gotta have a new piece for everybody. Some of us know that they break things often, so they have backup pieces. And then some of us know that other people crack their stethoscopes often when they drop them. So they have literally like cricket pieces um, on the units that you can just use that are disposable. So you just put it on, clamp your thing together, screw your top back on, and then you listen to your patient and then you unscrew it, you take it out, you dispose of it, you put another one on and you move on to the next patient, believe it or not, because these things break and crack pretty often. Your earpieces. Look at how, how hard these earpieces are. I can tell you just by looking at it, those things are going to kill your ears. They have squishy pieces. Those are hard too. I hate those. They have squishy pieces that are in your box. So all you do is you literally just take those off. You can unscrew them and then put the good pieces on and you're done. Your pieces on your tubing, they come off right here. They come off right here. This also comes off. These, this tubing right here and this tubing right here. You literally just pull it off. And have you ever noticed that there is usually a thing of medical tape right here on every nurse, on every stethoscope? And everyone's like, how do you get that tape there? Right? It's like some big weird anomaly that we can do. Dude, all you do is you just pull that off, pull that off, put your medical tape in there, and then pop it back on, pop it back on, done. This is really uh, an old school tool that is still just as killer as it was the day it was invented. So it's your best buddy. Now, let's talk about the things you don't do. Do not hang this up 
on your dash because you're cool and you're a nurse. Because what happens is, is when you leave it in your car up around your rear view mirror to show everybody that you're a nurse because you're proud of who you are, but you're kind of, you're kind of playing the clout game. You need to back off. If you choose to do that, cool. All you're going to do is kill this tubing. You are going to burn through this tubing, especially in the summer, especially in a window if you don't have a shade tree around you. All of this tubing is just going to go sour. It's going to start turning color, and when it turns color, you're going to start losing your ability to have sound, and then you got to buy a whole new stethoscope because you won't be able to hear anything. So watch yourself. All of You can always tell a brand new nurse because I swear to God, the vet nurses never do this. <laughs> the nurses that have been a nurse for five years, they don't do this either. You can always tell a brand new nurse it's like a mm, two years or less in because they'll have it on uh, they'll have it on their rear view mirror. And while that's super cool, and I know you're so proud of that, you are going to torture your tool that you use on a daily, that you use on an hourly basis, sometimes even more frequent than that. Do not ruin your tool. This is like your number two pencil, and you're doing a Scantron, and you guys probably don't know what a Scantron is because I'm old and you guys aren't. So take care of your tool. It's the only tool you've got. Um, eventually, you guys will get into uh, the mentality of having multiple stethoscopes. I have always been the weirdo that has the custom-made stethoscopes. Um, because I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what I do and I like for my stuff to match. You guys know how I have my gold shoes and my gold stethoscope that goes with it. I mean, it just is what it is. Um, if you want to get that crazy, I can show you a lot of websites that have really inexpensive stethoscopes that are kind of killer looking. So we'll get to that later just for now. That's the anatomy of your stethoscope. You know what you can pull apart and what you can't pull apart. Don't put it in the sun, whatever you do, right? And don't ever bleach them because if you bleach it, it starts messing up your tube in two. Um, so soap and water is always the best way to go uh, with like a, a, like a wipe um, or a disinfectant wipe is okay. But I wouldn't stick a whole bunch of bleach on it when COVID hit um, and I started putting bleach all over these things because we had to. Um, it ruined several stethoscopes and one of them cost me about 600 bucks uh, because I just didn't know right and remember I'm the queen of if it's if it's gone wrong I've done it so listen to me don't waste your money um, by messing up your stethoscope on accident all right next slide so know your diaphragm know your belt know what sounds you're supposed to hear and what side um, and then you should be pretty good to go on to the next slide after this one because I feel like we've already talked this one into a wall all right, so now we have blood pressure cuffs, and blood pressure cuffs are going to be a whole other department in itself. Um, cuff sizes vary. Please know that if your cuff is too big, your blood pressure is going to show abnormally low. If your blood pressure cuff is too tight, it is going to be abnormally high. Okay, how do I remember that, Molly? All right, cool. I'm going to help you out. Most of you who are in nursing are women traditionally, so cool. Have you ever worn a sports bra or a, a Spanx or a body shaper that was far too tight and you felt like you couldn't breathe and your heart rate started racing and you started getting really, really hot because you were like, oh boy, this isn't going to fit. This is too tight. Okay, well, that's what happens to your arm when you're doing a blood pressure. So it's going to be abnormally high because you are going to be abnormally in what's called a sympathetic nervous system state because you're getting squeezed to death versus if it's too big, it's floppy, you have all the room in the world, and it's going to be lower because you aren't going to really react to it. If that makes sense to you, hopefully it does. So please understand the concept of both and what's going to make it too high and too low. And uh, I think we can move on from this slide at that point. All right, so equipment to measure blood pressure, we have NIBPs, which is non-invasive blood pressure cuffs. I had a student ask me, well, what is an invasive blood pressure cuff? And I'm like, haha, we're talking about art lines then. That's a whole nother deal. Um, we will not get into art lines in this class, but you will in later classes. So let's just focus on just the basic, what they call Dynamap um, blood pressure cuff, which is the basic one that we use for everyday blood pressures. Uh, when we talk about our lines and we talk about arterial blood pressures, we're talking about ICU. Uh, so there's no need to get into that right now, but we will eventually. So it senses blood flow vibrations. Ah, there goes that word again. Remember how I said everything is done in energy, frequency, and vibration. This whole entire universe is built on energy, frequency, and vibration. And you, um, as individuals, all have that ability to create 
to uh, transmute said energy frequency and vibration. And another one of these things that we do to measure vibrations is blood pressure. Again, we're sensing the blood flow, we're sensing the vibration, we're converting it to an electronic impulse, we're converting it into a, a numerical readout so that we understand what that looks like. All right, so that is basically what a blood pressure does. All right, so here are the blood pressure devices. Um, a is going to be your traditional blood pressure cuff. You guys should have these in your nursing bag. You should have already done your first blood pressure. Um, for those of you who are doing it on Friday, I will be working with you on that. For those of you who had class with me yesterday, we had a big old fun time. Um, I had a uh, I had someone do my blood pressure. You know who you are, and um, just listening and coordinating, holding the holding the bladder, holding um, the gauge, understanding the gauge, fill in for the pulse. It's a lot of steps. It's going to take some finesse and a little bit of time. Don't get upset if you don't know how to do it. We're going to check those off. I think next week, and you guys are going to do fine. It's okay. All right. I'm going to be right there. I'm not going to go failing people for the sake of failing people. That's not how you learn as a nurse. That's not how you become your best self as a nurse. I don't know who decided that that was ever a good idea in academia, but they're dumb. How about that? I'll throw that out there. They're dumb. You don't go kicking somebody away who wants to be here, who wants to try to be a nurse. So don't ever feel like you're going to fail in my presence because you didn't check off on a skill right. We're going to go through it together. I will show you how to do it. I will do it for you um, so that you can see how I do it because that's how a lot of people learn. And then I will literally take as much time as I need to get you checked off. So don't freak out because it's a process of kind of freaking out because it's a lot. I want you to be able to do it well, um, which is why we're going to have you do a series of blood pressures on other people. I'm going to know if you're lying. So do not like throw a whole bunch of results in and say that you did it um, when I know that you didn't do it. And I'm not going to tell you how I know, but I can always tell when someone is <clears throat> completely faking the fact that they've taken these, these test blood pressures. So make sure that you're doing them because we're going to have a side talk if that happens. And I'm going to make you do 40 instead of 20, right, just to learn your lesson because it's fair. Now the other blood pressure cuff over here is a more traditional one. This one's bought at like a Walgreens or a CVS. Uh, well, it's got a, this is a kind of a pseudo dynamap, if you will. Um, so these are used for home health. These are used, uh, some people have them personally because they have congestive heart failure or they have uh, pulmonary hypertension and they have to constantly monitor their blood pressure. Um, these are easy ones to use. They also have the ones that are on wheels. Those are the more traditional Dynamaps that have the bigger moving system and also has the pulse oximetry attached to it and a couple of other things that are kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's blood pressure devices in a nutshell. So this slide talks about limitations of the blood pressure devices. The blood pressure devices, I'm not going to let you know what the heart's doing uh, to an extent. It's not going to let you know how well the heart's beating. It's not going to show you the intensity or the rhythm of the heartbeat. That's why we have the uh, monitors at the nurse's stations. That's, that's what those are for. Um, it can also be programmed to repeat measurements if it needs to. Uh, the problem with that is if you are doing frequent vitals and your patient's sleeping, they might sleep out of whack. And you'll know because you will have um, their room uh, will show an improper blood pressure reading out of nowhere and you'll know that it's slipped out of way. Um, if you do get that, uh, make sure that you go check on your patient, though, because there is the exception where they're starting to tank on you and circle the drain, and you need to go check on that appropriately as fast as you can. But most of the time, it's just that it's slipped off or slipped out of place or slipped out of the way. Um, so you need to make sure of that. Oh, let me go ahead and give you my, my tall tale uh, of experience of what happened to a patient that I'm going to go ahead and embarrass myself. I was a nurse for uh, a year and I had a tech that I trusted very much. And, um, they told me that my patient, uh, had a blood pressure of 230 over 118 and they had checked it twice. And I may or may not have preemptively called a doc in a rapid response and had about 50 people run into the room and what was the problem? Uh, well, we didn't put the artery on the artery line. So let's talk about this. A blood pressure cuff has what's called an artery line on it. And you put the artery on the artery line. I cannot make these things up. 
So my tech who I trusted implicitly was training another tech at the time. And the tech literally just wrapped the cuff around the arm and didn't pay attention to the artery line. And then the blood pressure reading came up. Well, then she said, recycle it. And she recycled the pressure and it came back up again. So she trusted the new person who had three years of experience as an STNA who did not know what they were doing. So for the past three years, they've been giving inaccurate blood pressures. They literally just wrapped it around the arm, didn't pay attention, and it gave an abnormally high reading. And here I am calling a rapid and I look like an idiot. I never did that again. I have not done it since, and I will not do it since. If someone's got a reading that bad, I walk into the room, I do the blood pressure myself, I do it manual. And then usually at that point, I have the, let me guess, you didn't put the artery on the artery line, did you? Okay, let's have a talk. And then I give them the spiel. So make sure that you're checking these things because a lot of times if you get a ridiculous reading, there's a reason for it. Believe it or not, most people who are in um, a hospital aren't, 100% critical. They're really not. They're easily maintained. They usually don't have a lot of variance. Even in an ICU, most days, it's not that chaotic. Like for me, it isn't at least, right? So know that it's going to be okay, even when it's not okay, because there's always someone around you to use as a resource, but don't ever be afraid to be like, hey, listen, I made a mistake. Because the second you act like you don't make mistakes, that's the second they're going to start hounding in on you and micromanaging you and finding a way to try to get you to uh, mess up. Because nursing is a team effort. It is never just you. Please understand that. All right, next slide. All right. So again, let me get my little pen light out. See this right here? See the range? If that, when you roll it around, does not fit within the range, that is not the size. You need to get the next size up or the next size down. All right, where's my little artery line button? Oh, see that? See that arrow? See that beautiful little arrow right there? That says artery line. Put it on the artery, then wrap it around the arm, then take the blood pressure. Because if I hear that it's 200 something over 118 and I got a mean arterial pressure in the 160s, I got someone whose brain is about to blow a gasket and I cannot handle that. But if you did it because you didn't put the line on the line, we're going to have a problem because then I would have gotten nervous for no reason. And I don't like to get nervous. I rarely get upset. If I get upset, I need for you to know whatever direction I'm running in, you need to run with me. If there is a fire, you need to run away from me, right? There's no in between because if I'm upset, the whole world should be upset. That's how little I get upset. This will upset me. Put the artery on the artery line. Okay, I'm done. I'm not going to say it again. Artery on the artery line. Okay, next slide. All right, pulse ox. This is pretty um, accurate. It says highly accurate, non-invasive measurement. Let's talk about that. So whoever wrote the slide, God love them. They haven't been a nurse at the bedside. (laughs) I can tell you that right now because there are about 50,000 things that can mess up um, a measurement on pulse ox. So classic example, if I have atherosclerosis, right, which means I have poor circulation, you are not going to stick a pulse ox on my finger and it read appropriately. No, it's never going to happen. If I um, am anemic, and I'm in exacerbation, and my hemoglobin is six, you're not going to get a good pulse ox reading off of me. Because what happens is when you start to uh, circle the drain, right, like something's going bad, Um, I have a hemoglobin of six, my body is going to protect its core. Because what's in my core? Oh, I don't know, my intestines, my heart, my kidneys, my lungs, my liver, all the pieces and parts that I need. And my brain is up top. So what it's going to do is it's going to get all of the blood and it's going to shoot it to my brain and it's going to shoot it to my core and everything else doesn't matter. So what's going to happen? I'm going to get frozen fingers. Duh. If I have frozen fingers, guess what's not going to work? My pulse ox. So highly accurate is not an accurate statement. All right. Is it accurate when you have a perfect patient? Yes. Is it highly accurate when you have a perfect patient? Sure. If they're in the hospital, are they a perfect patient? Duh. No, clearly. So why are we even making that statement? I don't know. It's silly. I'm sure that they meant it's highly accurate in the event of having a perfect patient. So going back to the head and the, and the core piece, if you do have an anemic patient, and everything goes to the brain and to the core, then where would be a good part to put the pulse ox? Uh, On the ear, because it's attached to your head, right? 
See, I told you nursing's common sense. Nobody believes me. Everyone's like, oh my God, it's so hard. And I'm like, is it really though? The ears are connected to the head. We learned that in kindergarten, right? The knee bone's connected to the leg bone, right? That's kind of how that goes. Same concept. So sensor taped to ear, finger or toe. The sensors usually last about a day. If you stick it to a finger, it lasts a, about a day, but they're going to wash their hands. And are they going to wash that hand with a finger probe? Yep. Is it going to go bad? Of course it's going to go bad. So I don't like finger probes for that reason, but we have to have them for our patients, so I get it. Um, we're going to be changing these out very often. Infants, the foot, the palm of the hand, thumb can be used as well. So keep that in mind, and let's go to the next slide. All right, scales. Scales, we weigh people. I really don't know what else to say about this slide. Scales, we measure things. We, we see how tall or how heavy they are. And it does kilom or kilometers, <laughs> it does kilograms or it does pounds. Um, and they uh, need daily weights in a hospital a lot of times uh, because we have congestive heart failure patients. So yeah, scales, we use them. All right, next slide. All right, visual acuity and screening. So Snellen chart, uh, we need to know uh, what a Snellen chart is. So this is basically going to be the um, most uh, widely used uh, tool or chart to determine what visual acuity looks like. Um, so how it works is when we say we have 20-30 vision, what that means is, is I am able to see what other people can see at 20 feet I can see it at 30 feet. So that is what 2030 means. So what people can see at 20 feet, I can see at 30 feet or 2100 or however it works, right? Whatever, whatever that number looks like. So please understand that that is what that means uh, because it might be something that you see on your exam. So again, top number distance from the chart. Bottom number distance the person with normal vision should be able to read at the line. So if I have 20-20 vision, I'm 20 feet away from something, and I can see at 20 feet what other people see at 20 feet, right? However, if it's 20-40 or 20-50, 20, what regular people can see at 20 feet, I can see at 40 or 50. And I think that should be okay. Um, and Snellen is going to be used the same for an e-chart as well with little kids. All right, please remember the difference between Snellen, which is visual acuity, versus uh, Jaeger and Rosenbaum, which are used for near vision, okay? Um, so please understand how it's used and what it's used for, and then you should be good to go with the slide. All right, ophthalmoscope, let's talk about this. So otoscope and ophthalmoscope, for whatever reason in my brain, have always been the same thing. Um, and by the same thing, I mean they sound the same in my brain. I know they sound totally different saying it out loud. But for whatever reason, when I am looking to say otoscope, ophthalmoscope comes out and vice versa. So here's how we do this. Let's learn Latin really quick because I teach Latin. So op, all right, op, eyes. <laughs> there you go. Done. So this is used um, as an instrument that uh, has mirrors, lenses, uh, it checks for a lot of different things, checks for uh, diabetic retinopathy in your eyes, it checks for your red reflex in your eyes, um, it checks through your pupils, you get to see all the little vesicles that are in your eyes, it's kind of gnarly, all right? We are not going to traditionally use this very much in a hospital setting. Um, you're traditionally not going to use it much at all in most of your settings. What you do need to know is that if you twist this, it turns on. If you twist it, it turns it off. Or there's an on-off switch here. Um, you need to keep it charged and ready for your physician if you're going to be working in um, like a primary care area because they will be using this often and they will be looking into it. Um, I, as a nurse, I've probably used this, I don't know, five or six times as a provider. It's a daily deal. Uh, it just depends on kind of what you're dealing with. Um, so yeah, that's an ophthalmoscope, op, optometry, eyes, done. All right, now let's move on to one more slide about ophthalmoscopes, then we'll go to otoscopes. All right, again. We're checking, uh, again, red, red free filter, shines green beams. Um, we can look for discoloration of a disc. We can check for hemorrhages. We can check, again, uh, to see if someone has diabetic retinopathy, uh, which is pretty prominent, or if someone has pulmonary hypertension as a result of diabetes, 
things of that nature. We can see all these things in the eyes. Um, we can see pupillary reflexes with this. Uh, ophthalmoscopes are just, you know, good for anything eye related. Um, but I, I don't want to get into it too much. That's why I'm kind of grazing over it very lightly because I feel like the amount of things you need to know about an ophthalmoscope as a, a beginning nurse is going to be nearly nil, right? It's just not going to be a thing. So let's move on to the next slide because um, otoscopes we use a little more frequently, um, although those are predominantly used by providers as well. So otoscopes are gnarly. They're my favorite thing in the whole wide world um, because, you know, what's more annoying than someone sticking a key in their ear to scratch it when you have an otoscope and you can go, hey, I can just look in there and see what's going on. It's probably an ear infection or it's probably something that's impacted that needs to go get looked at, right? So I have otoscopes and ophthalmoscopes at the house. I use my otoscope 10 times more than I use an ophthalmoscope ever um, because they have many uses, right? So it has an attachment, which is this little piece right here that wedges into this little piece right here. Um, it's going to be different for kids versus adults. If you have a child that is, uh, you know, under the age of three, you're going to pull down and back, actually you pull back and down. Um, and then you pull back and up if they are over the age of three, that's a, a easy shortcut. So under the age of three, pull down over the age of three, pull up in order to look and, and get a bird's eye view of what's going on in there. Be warned, there's no telling what's going to be in those ears. I have seen all kinds of things in ears. I've seen fungus in ears. That's kind of gnarly. It literally looks like mold. It kind of makes you sick. I've seen bugs in ears that were live. Um, I have seen Legos in ears. I have seen, oh boy, what's the weirdest thing I've ever seen before? Oh, I saw a needle in the ear one time. And I'm like, what were you doing with a needle in your ear? You ready for this? I was trying to get a blackhead. Okay, in your own ear? How could you see the blackhead? And did you not understand that when it goes into the hole and you let go of it, it doesn't come back? What were you thinking? Well, where was this blackhead? Well, I go to look at the blackhead and the blackhead is literally at the top of the ear, uh, which is nowhere near the hole of the ear, which is dead in the center. So I don't even know what happened. And I don't even want to know. That was probably one of the, the weirdest, wickedest things that I've ever seen in an ear. Um, other than that, it's usually, you know, wax or... Uh, some type of event uh, like hair impaction or a fungus or the occasional bug because you know people don't keep themselves clean but the needle for real what was that about so otoscopes uh, Oto. Uh, if we give someone too much Lasix they can have ototoxicity and lose their hearing so Oto is synonymous with ears done that way you don't get the two mixed up and you don't look silly like I used to next slide all right, pen lights. Pen lights are a focus light source, really good for checking things like uh, pupillary constriction to make sure that your pupils are uh, what they call perla. Pupils are equal, uh, reactive, reflective to light and accommodation. I think I got that right, P. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Yep. Yep, that's right. I mean, I haven't said perla since nursing school, and that was like uh, probably 10 years ago. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, 10 years ago. Wow, it's been 10 years since I graduated. That's nuts. All right, so yeah, pen lights. You're going to, on a neurology unit, you're going to use it religiously, right? Like this is just as cool as your stethoscope. Uh, mine is actually gold gilded, uh, like my gold stethoscope, because I'm a nerd. Uh, they go with my gold shoes, uh, because it looks super cool. And we all got to be unique somehow, right? So I like my things flashy. Some people um, make them real cute and bedazzle them. I think that's a little bit much for me, but whatever. Do what you want to do with them. For now, please understand that um, your main job with this pen light is to look into throats, look into noses, and look into eyes, and sometimes ears. Um, it also works really well when you have it in your hand and it's dark outside and you got to open your front door. She's your pen light. It's got, it's a multifaceted piece of equipment that is uh, definitely worth its weight and everything. So make sure that you are using the pen light that has all the little circles on it. You have two, you have one that's like the cheapo, just tap, 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 and then it'll work. Use, invest yourself in one uh, AAA battery, which is what I think it takes. 
and put it in there. Use the really nice white one that's got the clicky pin on the top because those are going to show you your different size of pupils. And until you learn how to really, really go, okay, that's definitely a two. Okay, that's definitely a three. Okay, that's definitely a five. Um, use that one versus the little quick fix one. We made you use the quick fix ones the other day because it was in your bag and it was already charged. And you have to get a battery for the other one. Go get one at the dollar store because you're going to need it. Trust me. Um, that's all I got for the slide. Ruler and tape measure. Couple of things I'm going to say about this. One, they're usually paper, so don't use them on another patient after you use them on one. I don't care if they got a wound or not. If they definitely have a wound, throw it in the trash right that second and don't think a second thing about it because that's crazy. Um, I've seen people who have taken tape from one room to the other and you want to talk about gagging? I nearly did. It was kind of gross. Um, so yeah, tape measure, ruler. We know what these things are. We've used them before since grammar school. Uh, tape measure is really good for circum circumferential things. Um, okay, well, how do you measure depth? Well, I'm glad you asked. You use a Q-tip. So every one of your Q-tips that you have when you're dealing with wounds, it's going to have a measuring tool on it. So you literally jab the ends. Well, not jab. That sounds a little violent. You literally just want to lightly prod into the area until you get resistance and then you take it out and then as soon as you take it out you put it to your stick your paper that came with the packaging and you just put it right there and then you can measure it right that second so every uh, piece of measuring equipment is going to be attached to the packaging itself so that way you could get your your length your width your depth all of that your tunneling on a wound you can all get that immediately um, and then you can have it annotated in the epic charting or whatever charting system you use. All right, next slide. All right, so I'm going to quickly talk about nasal speculums because unless you work in the ER, you're never going to use this ever, never, 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 never. Like I've never used a nasal speculum in my entire nursing career uh, or as a provider. If I'm on, nope, I did ENT one time. When I was in my ENT residency, I used a nasal speculum and it was just to open up um, a cavity to see if somebody had something going on and they did. They had an abscess in their nose that was a, a tumor actually. Uh, other than that, unless you are an ENT provider or you work in the ER and someone shoves something up their nose and you have to use a speculum, as a nurse, you're never going to use this before or, or you're never going to use it, period. But I'll show you what it looks like. It's a really gnarly like tool. Um, it's metal kind of looks like a speculum uh, for like a vaginal canal because it works the same way, but it's a lot smaller. Um, and these are the types that you can use. I'm not going to test you on nasal speculums because you're never going to see it. So next slide. And again, this is reminiscent of a vaginal speculum in my opinion. It's just a tinier model of it. Uh, it goes into the nasal cavity, opens it up so that it's a little bit easier to see in there. Um, a lot of people who are speech pathologists sometimes use it. Uh, to see if there's a deviation of a septum. Obviously, if you're in surgery uh, and plastics, you're going to do that. But otherwise, on a med surgery unit, I've never even seen this tool at all on a med surgery unit. So there's really no, talk, not even on an ICU. Well, yeah, we have one on an ICU. But other than that, it's not often used. So we can just move to the next slide. All right, this is your tuning fork. Every neurology, neuroscience, neurosurgery nerd is going to have a tuning fork. I have a tuning fork. Yes, it is gold gilded. Yes, it is ridiculous and obnoxious. Yes, you're welcome, because I think it's fabulous. So this is going to help us with auditory screening. This is going to let us know the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8, is damaged. This is going to also let us know if you have neuropathy. This is going to let us know if you have a unilateral stroke, right? Because you feel dull sensation on one side versus the other. This works off of v -v 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 vibration. Oh my God, there's that word again, energy frequency vibration. This woman's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just tuned into science really well because it's not magic. It's just science. So I'm going to stop. Nikola Tesla is the greatest mind we ever had in human history. He's smarter than Albert Einstein. As a matter of fact, Albert Einstein was asked by Time Magazine in 1942, uh, what is it like to be the smartest man that ever existed? And he goes, I don't know. Ask Nikola Tesla, right? So they used to fight back and forth. And Nikola Tesla is largely in part the reason that we understand vibrational pattern the way we do. Because uh, you ever heard of an MRI machine? Yep, he created it. He created it 
for a different reason that we actually use it for. He created it to help Mark Twain, who was a famous author, who had a uh, big bowel problem. Uh, he was unable to poop, basically. And he would get perforated intestines and he would get very, very sick and he was that way since a child. When Nikola Tesla created the MRI machine, because when he would walk by the MRI machine, he would suddenly have to go to the bathroom. Why? Well, because as the MRI machine was going, energy frequency and vibration started moving into his intestines, right? And that's how we understand vibration the way we understand it today. You ever heard of, I don't know, an x-ray machine? Yep, Nikola Tesla. First x-ray ever taken was of his hand and his foot. Um, so yeah, super cool guy. Look him up. He is the basis for most medical science and nobody even knows that he exists. So there's that. So I talk about him a lot because I've been studying his work since I was 10, uh, because he's kind of cool and I'm kind of a nerd. So yeah, tuning forks, vibration. It will let us know all the way to the bone if a person is feeling something. Right, and we need to know that, especially when we're on a neuro unit, to find out if someone's stroked out or not. So that's tuning fork. And next slide. All right, this is a percussion or reflex hammer. How has everyone ever seen this? Because we jab it into a kneecap and then they kick out into the planet. Okay, none of those things are accurate. First off, I've never seen anyone have that reflex and it be real. Um, you will have that reflex in your knee and it will bump maybe a couple of inches, but you're not going to go kicking anything. That's all for comic relief. Do you know that you can tell a resident physician versus an old school physician? You can tell how long they've been in practice because they won't even carry a reflex hammer. They'll just use their stethoscope. <gasps> oh my God, how? Because they use the diaphragm as the reflex hammer. Am I going to tell you to do that? No, don't do it. But can you do it? Absolutely. Do I use a reflex hammer? No, I do not. I do not have one in my pocket because that is just one more thing I have to carry. So this is used traditionally to check reflexes um, or you can use your stethoscope. On a neuro unit, this, you would have to have this um, because they check many reflexes in many different areas and you don't need to go knocking somebody with a really heavy diaphragm of a stethoscope. But if you're just doing it on like a primary provider unit, it happens all the time. It's not a big deal. Uh, matter of fact, it's a mark of hey, you know your stuff, right? Because you got to do it just right in order to get it good. So yeah, um, I think we can move on to the next slide. I'm not going to test for it. I'm just trying to teach you what it is so that you can recognize it, know what it's called, know what it's for, and then move on. All right, we're nearly done. It's been 66 minutes. I'm going to try to just blow through the rest of this because they're important, but we don't need to get into like grave detail about it. Um, I'm going to be working on your next set of slides that you need to do. Um, I'm going to be doing your comprehensive overview before I actually do the other chapters to your material because I didn't realize how long it really takes to download all of this stuff. It takes me nearly 10 hours just to get one video uploaded onto YouTube. And you guys know I have literally one video up on YouTube, so this is all new for me. So we don't have a lot of time. It's Tuesday, um, our exam's on Friday. So I think we're gonna do the comprehensive overview first. And then after the comprehensive overview, which you're gonna need for your examination, then we will move on to getting this other stuff thrown in there for you. So this is the Doppler. Doppler basically uh, checks pulses in the feet, pedal, post-tib. Um, that's what it's predominantly used for. We need to make sure that we're getting proper flow into our feet because if we had cold, dead legs, then that means something is wrong and there is an occlusion and that occlusion has to be fixed. Am I going to um, quiz you on this? Uh, I think that the best I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you if a person has cold feet and they have pulseless feet, what are you going to go run to go get? And the answer is going to be you're going to run to go get a Doppler. But I'll get into that later on, so don't worry about it. Let's just move to the next slide. So this is the part as a professor where I have two choices. I can go, I'm going to tell you everything I know about a goniometer because I'm a subject matter expert at everything because I'm a professor of nursing, which means I know everything about everything. Or there's the other side where I'm like, I don't even know how to say goniometer. I'm going to go ahead and check Google say to make sure I say it right. So I don't sound like an idiot because I've literally never used this in my entire life. And I've worked on many uh, a med surge and many a ortho unit and this has never even been a thing. I don't even know who uses this. <laughs> I don't even know what this is about. Um, 
and I probably have just made myself look like a butt. But remember, I have worked nationwide as a traveling nurse, opening and closing COVID units since its inception. And prior to that, I've worked on many ICUs nationwide uh, to include Cleveland Clinic, Miami Valley, Ohio Health System, OSU. Um, I think I got a little bit of clout to open my mouth and say these things and not look like a fool, but yeah, there's always going to be one person. So whatever. Uh, never used this, never seen this. I have an ancient tool that is an artifact because I have a, a degree in museum curation as well uh, so that I can buy and sell artifacts. And I have something that looks similar to that, um, but that was not what it was used for. It was actually used um, as a measuring device for pyramids. Um, so <laughs> this is a thing, apparently. If you think I'm going to test you on it, you lost your mind. It's not happening. Uh, please understand that it's placed over a joint to find out the angle with which a joint is able to be measured. Uh, that's what traction is for. Uh, we have other devices to use nowadays. Uh, this is probably used with physical therapy. Um, I, if you see it in nursing, take a picture of it, send it to me and be like, hey, hey, because I would love to see that. Uh, that would be your challenge. Otherwise, I don't think you're ever going to come into contact with it. Um, I don't know how it works other than there's an angle literally right here and they're going to see how far you bend it. They're probably going to stick this at the ball and socket joint, perhaps the acetabulum, uh, which is, you know, your hip flexor and go, okay, uh, I want you to um, do uh, abduction, right? And let's see what that angle looks like. So they stick it at the acetabulum and they go, yep, that's about it. Or maybe the elbow, right? That makes more sense. So they go, all right, uh, I want you to take it distal to your body. All right, take it proximal to your body. All right, what's that angle? What's the longest angle you can do? Other than that, it's not a thing that I'm familiar with. So sorry. Um, I guess look at it, know what it's used for, move on. Yeah, let's do that. Next slide. So calipers for skin thickness. Now let's look at this thing. What's the first thing you see? I see the most ridiculously triggering thing in the world. And I don't even get triggered, right? Because like I'm, I'm, an, I'm a Gen X kid. Gen X kids, there were no triggers. There were no gluten allergies. We were like feral children. The last, the last generation of feral children where we just roamed about like cats. And uh, I'm upset at the fact that I see fat o meter on this thing. What were they thinking? I mean, geez, we live in a world where, you know, people get triggered if they see the color violet because it reminds them of some deep suppressive memory that they have. I mean, why would you call this a fat o meter in this generation? That's nuts. So what does it do? Well, these little calipers open and you squeeze them down. And if you have a personal trainer like I do, uh, I just started, so you can go ahead and not laugh at him. Um, I That was a funny joke. I thought it was funny. So you you would put these over at uh, an area of adipose tissue or fat and see what that measurement looks like to determine uh, what their overall body fat looks like, okay? Um, I've had these used before for that purpose. Have I ever used them in a hospital setting? Uh, no. Maybe on a bariatric use it, you know, they would use these, but why God, why would you do that? Because they would just be post-op. So that wouldn't make any sense. I don't even know why this is a slide if I'm honest, but Hey, remember the calipers for skin thickness is measured by the fatometer. <laughs> and then let's move to the next slide. Cause that's insane. All right. Vaginal speculum. You guys are never going to use these unless, uh, yeah, that's right. You're never going to use these unless you get into your doctoral practice. Then you'll use it once while you're in your residency and you'll be like, all right, cool. Uh, more than likely I don't want to do this for a living. And then you move on. Um, at least that was my, that was my fun with uh, the vaginal speculum. It's not hard to use. They're not intimidating. They just look like duckbill platypuses. Um, and they open up the vaginal canal so you can get a sample to see if someone's got HPV, to see if someone has um, any type of disorders or abnormal cells, da 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 um, so that's the vaginal speculum and this one has a light attached to it and these are more traditional and that is all you need to know about that. Oh, and your pinky sits right there because uh, it's just more convenient that way. Yeah, that's that's all there is to it. All right, next slide. This is an autoscope or audioscope. 
Um, it's for hearing acuity. It will measure tones. This little piece right here goes into the ear and then it'll hit a button and it'll go, eh, ee, ee, right? So old people, uh, older people don't understand high frequencies anymore uh, because their ability to interpret high frequencies is gone. Um, that you will need to know for, I think, exam three, but don't worry about it because we're going to go over it again. Um, again, energy, frequency, vibrational pattern. I, I cannot make this stuff up. If you understand energy, frequency, vibrational pattern, you're going to understand this entire world and it's going to open up uh, like, oh my God, how, what just happened? I took the red pill because you see things in a whole different light. And once you start, you can't go back. Um, and it makes you incredibly successful and incredibly proud of who you are as an individual. And if you're proud of who you are and you're confident in who you are, that energy frequency and vibrational pattern that you carry within you start to reverberate to other people. And you will notice that other people want to be around you. They want to be a part of you. They want you to take massive roles for the masses, like teaching the very first class of your entire nursing career so that you stay with them for their entire program so that they succeed because they trust you, because you're confident in yourself, because you understood something as simple as energy frequency and vibrational pattern which is what I'm teaching you guys so my hope is since you guys are my guinea pigs and my first group that we're doing this with my hope is that when you get out of nursing school not only are you gonna have the mad swagger and that mad sauce in your soul that you have by you just being you but you're also gonna have that nursing knowledge and that confidence within you to be able to muster up enough courage to learn and to grow and to be a solid individual when you come out of the gate. And I know I can do that for you because I know what I am and I didn't have a book or a mentor and you got both of those things and lots of them. And I'm super excited for you. So audioscope, hearing frequencies, older people don't hear higher frequencies very well. Let's move on from that and go into monofilaments. Filament is a fiber monofilament is one so the next slide you're actually going to have a monofilament on the slide because i couldn't get it on this slide for whatever reason it's a small flexible wire um, it it bends um, at any pressure at all it's trying to see how sensitive you are with feet so we use monofilaments when we're chest checking for uh, neuropathy in the feet we do it in primary care uh, when we have a diabetic patient every third visit we're going to automatically do a monofilament test um, some of them do it every visit right they know when they come in the door just take your daggone shoes and socks off make sure you wash your feet because we're going to be smelling them right if you can get to them and um, we're going to just poke, 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 poke. And they'll go, yes, yes, yes. And if you poke them and they say nothing, you'll know that they have neuropathy in that area. Okay, that's a monofilament. Looks like a piece of, ooh, ooh, this is perfect. You ready? Oh, I love how I do this. Brain blast. Okay, so a brain blast means I just had a fantastic idea that's going to be very important for you to understand and for you to 100% be able to solidly uh, comprehend what I'm giving you. So you know how you buy a brand new shirt and you take the tag off and there's always that piece stuck in the armpit that's like that uh, little T piece? That is a monofilament. That is exactly what it looks like. It looks like that little T piece where they had the tag attached to it and the armpit of your shirt or your blouse or your skirt or whatever. So next slide, I'm going to show it to you and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. And then we're going to talk about trans illuminators. So for monofilament, know that it's to check for diabetic uh, feet um, and to check for sensitivity to touch. All right. Top bar. Am I not right? Monofilament. That This top piece, that's a monofilament. So same concept as the tag that we just talked about. This is a transilluminator. Transilluminators are um, looking for anything in a, in a space, a plural space, if you will, right? So it is placed over the body cavity and it transmits light uh, with different colors um, to determine if something has air, fluid, or if it's just basic tissue. YouTube this because I can't explain to you what it looks like to use one, but it's pretty cool. Um, and we, we can use this with a pen light as well, especially if you have someone with congestive heart failure 
and they have an enlarged scrotum, a lot of times we will put the pen light uh, near the tissue and it will illuminate very differently. It kind of looks like a, like a night light, if you will. And that tells us there's a ton of fluid in there um, so that we need to go ahead and give them some more Lasix to get that fluid off of them. This is the same kind of concept. All right, next slide. So this is a Woods Lamp, and a Woods Lamp I've never used for fungal infections of the skin. I've only ever used it when I'm dealing with a corneal abrasion. I had a guy uh, when I worked, uh, it was Ohio Health, it was in Ashland, it was about eight years ago. Nope, I lied. It was about six years ago. And um, I was working in uh, the occupational therapy department. And this guy was working in a factory and um, he got his goggles got knocked off by a large piece of metal and he got a piece of shrapnel of that metal in his eye. So we had to do a woods lamp to find it so that we could have it removed and I actually picked it out of his eye. It was kind of gnarly. Um, it was in the sclera so it didn't damage his eye luckily. But you put a dye in there and then you put the woods lamp over it and then it turns fluorescent so that you can see that piece because had I not done that, I would have never seen it in that sclera because it was so tiny and when I put the dye on it and put the lamp over it, it turned out to be a huge shard and I had no no way of, of ever seeing it and the sclera and the poor boy was just miserable, absolutely miserable. Um, side note, when you penetrate the sclera of an eye with a shard of a metal or glass, A, it doesn't bleed, believe it or not. B, there's nothing that like comes out of it. People are like, is there jelly in there? I'm like, nope, not at all. Um, that isn't a thing. And C, you have no idea how deep it can go and not affect anything. Um, if it hits the sclera, it doesn't affect your visual acuity. It just hurts like the Dickens. Um, and he was fine within a couple of days. It was very bizarre. So that's my story about Woods Lamp and let's move to the next slide. So there's also magnification devices that you have that will help you with inspecting wounds. If you have a wound that needs inspected, you're not going to need a magnification device because if you're in a hospital and someone has a wound, it's going to be visible with a naked eye. So you're not going to have to be uh, any bit concerned about it. Um, this is more for um, identification of skin lesions that could be a cancerous uh, cell. This is used often in primary care, not so much in hospital settings. I doubt you're going to see it. Um, so yeah, let's move out of here. Hey, magnification devices make small things big. Done. All right, let's move to two end click style questions. I finished this in 81 minutes. That's painful. Um, hopefully I can finish the whole thing by 85 and then I can start working on your overview for your examination. All right, so here's your NCLEX style question. The nurse is preparing the room for a dermatologist. The nurse knows that the patient may have a fungal infection in the left leg. Which tool is not part of the setup for this assessment? Well, we just talked about Wood's Lamp and how that's going to be a thing. So that's used for fungal infections apparently. So it's not going to be that one. A magnifier is going to make small things big, so we need to have that as well. A monofilament is going to be used for diabetic testing to see if someone's got neuropathy. So I doubt that's going to be the answer. So that's probably going to be the answer because that's not part of it. And a ruler we're going to use for any type of fungal infections because we need to see how large it is so that we can check a baseline. So monofilament is going to be our answer here. And here we are, the answer is monofilament, so that is correct. Monofilament is not going to be used uh, to check a fungal infection because this is for neuropathy. It's the wrong tool for the wrong um, assessment. All right, collection of objective data from a patient with a swollen left elbow includes which piece of equipment? Oh my God, no, I just talked all that trash. No, this can't be a thing. Okay, see, this is what happens. Karma just, just bit me in the tailbone um, and said, what's your name? And I said, Susan, I'm sorry, it's Susan. Um, so what are we gonna use? We're not gonna use a magnifier. We're not gonna use a blood pressure cover. We're not gonna use a Snellen chart. Okay, everyone can laugh at me. We're gonna use what? We're gonna use the goniometer, or however I pronounced it, because I've already forgotten it because I've used it that little in my existence. Hold on, wait. Goniometer. Goniometer. See, I already had it, I told you. Goniometer. See, right? 
whole bunch of doctorate degrees, whole bunch of other degrees, and I'm still Googling things at 40 years old. Don't let anybody make you feel like you are anything other than just as spectacular as you are right now in this moment from the day you were born until the day you sat right here, okay? Nobody is better than anybody in this world. Don't let them fool you. It's all smoke and mirrors. All right, my darlings. And I just got busted in front of everybody. So it's fantastic. <laughs> hey, Google, can you give us the answer to this question? Goniometer. Goniometer. Answer's D. All right. We'll see you next time.